Good morning. Welcome to Wednesday's session. Um, we have David Atch, the Vice President of Research at CyberX, presenting Mind the Air Gap, Exfiltrating ICS Data via AM Radios and Hacked PLC Code. Um, at the end of the session, since it's being recorded, when we get to Q&A, please use the stand-up mics that are in the aisleway in the middle so that everybody can be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So thank, for, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'll start a little bit about myself and about the company. My name is Dev David Ach. I'm the VP of Research. I've been uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces in the CER team, and so basically I um, was doing a lot of reverse engineering and malware analysis, and the two guys that did the research with me are also ex-military with years of expertise. And as a company, what we're doing, we're protecting industrial networks. That means we have a product for continuous monitoring in industrial networks. So as part of the research we're doing all the time, um, we decided to do some research about air gap networks. And that's what I'm going to show you today. So a few, few things that we're going to talk about. First, um, OT networks, a little bit about OT networks, uh, some possibilities how to get inside OT networks. Um, and once you're getting inside an OT network, how do you get the data out? And we'll talk why we need to get the data out. And we'll show our way of exfiltrating data, even if the network is not connected. So classical OT and IT network um, infrastructure will probably um, will be separated by um, some physical air gap. That means the only thing that will connect between the two, the two networks is some um, um, one direction diode, which gives the ability to transfer data from the OT to the IT network. Uh, for example, you have a factory and you're producing uh, some products and you need statistics you know, to send to your regulators or to make um, um, your fi financial statements. So you need the data from the OT network. And so there has to be a link from the OT to the IT. But vice versa, it's a little bit dangerous because OT networks are operational networks. That means they produce something. That means they're critical. That means if something, some malware gets inside and harms them, it probably causes a lot of financial problems. Uh, financial losses, and they're more critical than the IT networks. Um, so they're usually not connected to the internet, although we have seen some clients that do connect them to the internet, uh, but that's not the scope of their presentation. So we're talking about non-connected internet networks, and if you have a non-connected internet network, it's hard to get in but again, it's, it's not impossible. And once you're in and you want to get the data out from the network because you want to like, um, understand what's going on there, um, it's also hard, but also not impossible. So why do we need to take data from operational networks? I mean, it's just machines, it's just devices that produce something. Um, in order for a malicious actor to execute an attack and on OT network, on operational network, it's, um, it's not something you can do just from home without thinking, just writing something generic. It needs to know exactly what's going on on the network. That means um, these networks have like um, dozens of protocols, thousands of different vendors, um, different devices, uh, different architectures. Um, there are safety devices that uh, make sure that uh, other OT devices won't be, won't be harmed or shut down if something bad happens. And 
because there are so many vendors, there are so many possibilities, the first thing um, usually a malicious actor will do, it will collect data from the OT network. And um, we've seen it in previous attacks on, on ICS networks, on industrial networks. Every time, first, they collect the data, they understand how the network looks like, and then only they execute their real attack, the one that destroys something, that stops the power, that uh, causes some, some damage. So for, for us to map the network, we would like first to understand which devices are there, which security products are there, because if we're executing an attack, we we'll need like, to understand what we're up against. To. And um, probably we'll need also the schematics of the network and stuff like the ladder logic, which is the programming, to understand exactly how the process works. So if an attacker comes and wants to um, harm specific process in that network, it will need everything before you can do it. So just a few examples of how many attack vectors are in industrial networks. And um, it's just some samples. I'm sure you can think a lot of, you can imagine other attacks that might be executed there. Um, so the most, the most simple one is a malicious USB. Someone comes with a USB, infects the network, and you're saying, okay, but USBs are like, uh, it's, it's an old thing, like all the auto run stuff and all the like default execution stuff, but most of the OT networks are Windows XP based, even older stuff. So all these attacks like running an auto run inf, like I mean the auto run, um, like LNK exploits, or even DLL search order hijacking of industrial device of industrial software is possible in these networks because it's really a mess to upgrade an operating system inside an industrial network. Compatibility problems, problems with new software. Um, it's a critical process. You can't just stop the process and update your windows. You need like to stop the factory or something. So no one does that and they still have Windows XP machines there. Um, another scenario is another attack vector is a malicious engineering computer, engineering laptop. For example, some contractor or some external engineer comes with his laptop to, um, um, to write some code to, to the devices or to like, maintain the network. And he brings with his laptop some malicious, infects the network, and um, again, the network is infected. That's just another attack vector. And, and the third one is something that it's not an imaginable attack vector because it happened already a few times. So I'll give you a second examples. It's, um, there's a thing that malicious actors, if they want to get into, or into industrial networks, industrial clients, or something that does something with industrial, first they will infect the industrial vendor um, the industrial vendor, the investor provider, and in fact, it's software. And the first example is not, um, is not industrial, but an example for a malicious update. Uh, it was seen in uh, the attack in Ukraine, the NotPetya one. They infected uh, an update of the financial software, and basically everyone who had that financial software got infected by the update. Um, the second example, which is also relevant, uh, really relevant, because Dragonfly is allegedly a Russian attack group that attacked in the States. And um, what they were doing, they were pushing malicious updates uh, inside uh, ICS vendor software. And once um, clients that use that software, that ICS software, were downloading the updates, they were getting infected with Havex malware. So once we, I gave you a few, exa few examples how to get into the network. And what's, once we got into the network with the malware, with some malicious update that we created or some malicious USB, um, we still first need to get the data out. So 
we can wait for the laptop to come back or we can wait for the USB to come back, to connect back, so we can send the data with him. Um, but waiting for the USB or the laptop might take some time. And meanwhile, someone might detect our malware, might detect that we're inside the network and collecting stuff. So it's a little bit risky. Okay, so what we did in the research, we, um, we decided um, to start from a point that we're already in the network. Let's say we got inside the network. How we are going to um, get the data out, how we're going to exploitate the data. And what we did, we did it using a controller, using an industrial controller. And I'll give you like, few points about uh, how an industrial controller looks like, what it is exactly. So an industrial device is almost the same thing as a small computer. Think about it as some Raspberry Pi or Arduino. Um, it's usually with um, low processing speed. These devices are not like a supercomputer or something like that. They are not, uh, I think that even your um, your phone in your pocket is much faster and better in processing than these devices. Um, but their intention is to survive in harsh conditions and to make sure that uh, no matter what happens, the factory will still produce power or produce, um, produce its items and control the, the process. So if we look at the, um, at the ingredients of of a device like that, of an industrial device, it basically it has hardware with some inputs and outputs. For example, something from one side that connects to a sensor and from the other side connects to an oven. And once um, the sensor tells the device, look, the oven is too hot, uh, it makes sure that the oven will lower its temperature. So we have hardware, which are the connectors, the inputs and outputs. Uh, we have the storage, which stores like uh, basic firmware and some configuration and the ladder logic. And in order for the firmware to execute actions and to control like the sensor and control the oven, they need something that's called ladder logic. Ladder logic, it looks like, um, I'll show you in a second, um, it's a, programming it's a programming language. There are multiple variants of this language, and it basically controls the, the device. And it's like a schematic. It's, um, it's like a schematic that shows what should be done if some sensor, get, sensor tells some data, how you should proceed. So that's, um, that's an example of a ladder logic. Um, you see that looks like some, um, it's not an le electrical circuit, but um, it has all these uh, logical gates. And you basically can say, if something happens, do something like that. And it's basically, think about like a current that flows from left to right and activates this, these things, this logical, um, uh, sorry. Um, so, if you translate it to a normal code, it will look like the code that written downstairs. It's if something happens, do something like that or do something like uh, something other. So, um, letter logic consists of multiple ranks. Um, sometimes they run simultaneously. Um, they have like, you can, it's like uh, putting some functions and it's everything, although it looks graphical, everything translates to a code and you can even code like normal code. So our research was done on Siemens devices and Siemens devices uh, split their uh, ladder logic to like three main groups, um, three main types of blocks the first type 
uh, is organizational blocks. These are blocks that are running on the PLC uh, continuously and cyclically, and every time, everything, all the time executing something. You have function blocks, which is something like pieces of code or libraries. You can use them in the organization blocks or, or, or some other blocks. And um, you have the data blocks, which stores values, and it's like storage or like var vars for the ladder logic. So in our research, we decided to use um, the organizational blocks. And the cool feature about them is that you can push a new block inside a, an existing ladder logic, and you won't interrupt anything. I mean, the ladder logic will continue to run, and the organizational block will run uh, parallel to the others. It's not really parallel executing, but it's like parallel executing. So why did we use ladder logic in our research? Um, first of all, there's no and there's no antivirus software for industrial devices for PLCs. Um, probably, um, if you'll push there something, no one will know about it. No one will have the tools to investigate it. And it's, first of all, because there are so many vendors and sometimes, I mean, it's not like they have like a REST API, you can interact it and pull out data. You need to understand the protocol, you need to interact them with their specific software, and it becomes quite a task to forensically investigate these devices, these PLCs. Um, another thing, a ladder logic gives us persistency. That means once we inject it, um, it's there, it stays there. Um, first of all, industrial devices are not being restarted every day because they control a process. They control a factory, they're not going to shut down it. Like, if They might shut down it for maintenance, but it will be uh, very unique. And once you get the code, it stays there. So it's a great persistence mechanism. And previous research on the field of um, what you can do with malicious ladder logic show that you can do uh, with new devices, you can do almost whatever you want. Uh, the new Siemens devices have capabilities to open sockets, uh, to send UDP packets, just whatever you want. It's like, it's like programming some, some regular device. And the thing is, you can use ladder logic to collect all the data you want about, you, about the network. You can query other devices using SNMP. You can uh, even send exploits. You can just do whatever you want. So it's a really cool tool to um, scan your network. So, it's, so that's why we chose it. And um, our research uh, is based on other researchers done in the field, such as uh, Tempest. Uh, it's NSA paper uh, published like 35 years ago. And um, it basically describes how it's possible to exploitate data and about electrical emissions of devices. And there's also some cool open source called System Bus Radio, which plays, uh, which plays songs using just the CPU. You should check it out. Um, so for the purpose of the research, we used a few components. First one is SDR. SDR is software defined radio. That means I can take this device, connect it to an antenna, start uh, getting um, uh, frequencies, start getting signals around me, and from the other side, connect it to a computer and just programmingly um, get everything and analyze it and do whatever I want. So it's very easy, like. It's like a radio that connects to your computer. It's software-defined radio. And just for this research, we took a Siemens device. We didn't test on it on other devices, but we're sure it's going to work on other devices uh, because it's not an exploit. It's not some vulnerability in the device, in the Siemens device. Um, it's just like a feature of el every electronic device. So what we're doing, we're getting the PLC, 
we're injecting our malicious ladder logic. We, using the ladder logic, we collect data about the network. And then we're using the same ladder logic to exfiltrate the data out of the network. So remember, we talked about attack vectors, how you can get into a network, and the hard part is getting the data out. So once you got into the network, you injected the PLC, the ladder logic inside the PLC, and here's your way out. You're going to uh, use radio frequencies to exploit everything out. Um, few challenges. That's interesting. Few challenges we had while well, we done the research. Um, so first of all, we had to find the frequency of the device of the PLC that we were working on. Um, this image shows um, the frequency. It's from around 300 kilohertz to 400 kilohertz. And you see it on the x-axis. It's the frequency. On the y-axis, it's uh, uh, the time. So it's frequency over time. Um, and what we did, we were just browsing through the frequencies and looking and like connecting and disconnecting our PLC from the power and trying to understand what frequency it emits. So once we found it, um, we did some cool stuff. We, once we found the frequency, we decided that we wanted um, somehow to change it. I mean, we have a frequency. It works correctly. Everything is there. But we want to tweak somehow the frequency like make it stronger or, I mean, we want to tweak the emissions from the device to make them stronger or lower so we'll be able to encode data over the, the emissions and then to send it out. So we started by doing like a um, few tests to see what's going to trigger the change in the emissions. Uh, first, we tried some mathematical calculations. We did wrote a letter logic that does a lot of mathematical calculations, but um, it didn't change anything. Then we tried playing with the Ethernet cable, just connecting and disconnecting to see if um, the network adapter that is going on is going to change the frequency. So uh, it really changed the frequency, but disconnecting and connecting the cable is something that requires a physical access which is, it's not what we were looking for. We tried sending and receiving network traffic to and from the device, and it didn't affect the, the electromagnetic emissions at all. And then we said, okay, let's try and copy large memory buffers um, inside the memory of the device, of the PLC. And the thing, it didn't affect the strength of the emission, but it changed its frequency, which is very interesting because now we can control the frequency of the device. That means you can see on the picture on the, on the left, that's the original device when it does nothing. And on the right, it's when we're copying large memory buffers. We're doing like a large mem copy. So you can see that suddenly the, the frequency has shifted and once it's shifted, we can control it and we can somehow transmit data. So, because we knew that we can control it, we decided to start with something simple. We decided to encode some synchronization pattern. Um, you can see on the left, uh, you can see on the picture, is that we have the original frequency and then uh, we're telling the device, using the ladder logic, the, the code that's inside the device, um, copy a buffer for one second, then do nothing, and then copy a buffer again for one second, and then do nothing another, another one second. And you can see there's, there's a pattern, and we can detect it, and we can also later encode data. I'll just show it in a second, but uh, what you can see here is our synchronization pattern. We send it uh, in the start of every transmission, and then um, the receiver, the one with, that sits with the SDR, with the antenna, can know when to start decoding the data. 
he knows, okay, the data is being transmitted after this. So the state machine of, um, of the transmission is pretty simple. We start in s with some initialization. We uh, copy the data we want to send out of the PLC to some memory buffer. Then we're sending one or zeros that, um, again, remember sending one and zeros is just by using the mem copy. If, if I'm executing a mem copy, that means it's a one. If I'm not executing anything, that means it's a zero. So we're executing these mem copies and sending one and zeros just for the synchronization pattern. And then we're going to the memory uh, of the data we want to transfer and taking out bit by bit and just doing the same thing and transmitting it out. So I'll show you a few ranks that we wrote, a few letter logics, a few letter logic pieces of code. Uh, the first one is send bit. It's just sends a bit. And you can see here that uh, if it receives, for example, bit equals one, it's going to do the mem copy. It's going to copy the memory buffer. And that will generate the shift of the frequency that you've seen previously. And if, it's, if the bit is zero, it's not going to do anything. Just sleep for a second. Um, the sync pattern, it's the same thing, but do it repeatedly um, for like 10 seconds. It uses the, the same send bit that we've seen before. And uh, the last one is um, send the car bit, current bit, which takes a bit from the memory buffer and sends it using um, the method that we described before, copying a memory to the, to the PLC. So, OK. So it seems like we have done and we have already everything, but there are still a few, a few challenges. And the first one, if we are looking at the frequency, our range of frequency, which is uh, 300 kilohertz and 400 kilohertz, we can see that there are many repeating frequencies from the same type, but they're a little bit, uh, little bit modified. I mean, um, the, the ones on the right are more vague, and ones on the left are more seen clearly. So first of all, we wanted to um, to understand which exact frequency we're using. We can't use the whole range because uh, we'll get a lot of false positives. And so we needed to choose the exact one and accept the noisy data. There are also um, there are some, some noises from other devices like laptops nearby and other electronic devices that also emit emissions, uh, electromagnetic emissions. And the one we're interested in is that one because it looks the mo mo the mostly it looks um, really clear. It's um, it's not spreading, and um, that's ex the exact one that we wanted. But we needed something like to do it dynamically a little bit and to decide which one is the best. So. Um, we're taking um, pieces of frequencies, we're detecting where the frequencies, and correlating them with something that we're supposed to see. And you can see, for example, that um, on the upper image is a strong correlation, while the, uh, the lower image is, um, is a weaker correlation because it's, the frequency is more spread. Uh, and that's the strongest correlation. And that's how we choose our frequency. So first of all, we correlate it with what we expect to see and um, choose the, the best frequency so we can send the data in the best way. And we're doing the same correlation also for the data that we're sending. Or for example, in this case, it's a synchronization pattern. So Think about it. 
If we're sending one, it will be on this side. If we're sending zero, it will be on this side. We don't need the two sides. We can just take one side, put it on one dimensional array, draw it, and then try to correlate it to something that we know. For example, like the synchronization pattern. So we can see up there that we're correlating the graph that we draw according to the thing, to the frequencies, to the shift of the frequencies we've seen um, uh, from the SDR, and then we're collating to the uh, to the sync pattern that we're looking for. So the upper will collate stronger than the lower one, and then we'll know that's the synchronization pattern, and here it starts. And once we uh, detected the synchronization, we know when to start receiving data, we know what's the optimal frequency, we know how um, each bit correlates the, base, the best, and uh, we can start transmitting data. And just a few statistics before I'm showing you the demo. So we tested it um, with a great success uh, up to one meter. We're sure that a better antenna will give us more than one meter. We uh, tested the bandwidth. Um, it says here one bit, but it's actually one byte per second. And the only thing that um, determines the bandwidth is how good you are at clearing noise and uh, creating the right algorithms to, um, to find it faster. So, Better algorithms, better antenna, we can achieve much faster rates uh, for a much bigger distance. And to give some examples how we can use it in a real world scenario, think about someone that goes with some hidden antenna in his, poke in his pocket or uh, he puts the antenna somewhere, hides it in the ceiling or something like that. Um, so it's possible. And I'm going to show you the demo. Okay. So that's our setup. Um, we have um, on the right antenna, the SDR with a computer, and a device on the left with another computer. Um, we use that computer just for, uh, the computer on the left just for uh, configuring the device and uploading our LEDO logic, the ones uh, that sense the M, fre M frequencies, the radio frequencies. Sorry. Okay. So that's the LEDO logic we wrote to exploit the data. And here you can see that we're submitting the string that we want to send. We created like a custom web page. We can send a string, whatever we want. And once we submit the data, um, from this moment, the PLC already starts sending um, the radio frequencies, emitting the frequencies, and um, it's just doing it in a loop. So once we connect the antenna, we be able to catch it. So you see it's not connected to anything but just the power. And uh, the next thing, of course, is to configure the antenna to make sure we catch the optimal signal, we catch um, exactly what we want. And once everything is set up, um, that's how it looks. You can see that we, we're, sh we're shifting the frequency um, because of the data we're sending. And you'll see on the other screen there that the data is being transmitted to the air gap device. Yeah, that's it. So it works. Thank you. A few more things. So how would we defend against it? Uh, probably we would like to put something in the network that continuously monitors the network, looks for um, devices that are being programmed without the user knowing or the technician knowing about it. Um, 
would like to see devices that are starting to scan the network. And for example, a PLC that does a ping sweep is something that is uncommon in these networks and shouldn't happen. And of course, if there are new devices there, that shouldn't be there. So we think the continuous monitoring of industrial networks would be um, the easiest and the best way to solve it. Um, some more stuff. Um, we'll be at, uh, at ICS Village, um, it should be today, so you can come and meet us. Um, and we're, as part of the research, we're doing a lot of stuff like reverse engineering malware and discovering new malware. And we are a research featured in this book, in the Hacking Exposed book. So just check us on our website and that's it. Any questions? Yes. Is this the method that was used to take out the Iranian nuclear enrichment industry? No. Okay. Is this the method that was used to take out the Iranian nuclear enrichment centrifuges? So what they did in Iran, uh, the Stuxnet, you mean? They injected OB blocks. Um, in our case, we, we added uh, organizational blocks in order to exploitate data because that was the purpose of the research. Um, what they did in Stuxnet in Iran, they injected a ladder logic that caused harm to the centrifuges themselves. They were changing the speed of the rotation of the centrifuges. And once it was rotating faster or slower, um, it was uh, deteriorating much faster and they had to replace it all the time. So it caused them a financial, uh, financial losses. Um, they, they weren't exploiting data or generating aim frequencies, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but who knows? Maybe they'll do it next time. Mm. Sorry? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, hi, thank you for your time. I thought this presentation was really interesting. Um, so in, in the lab, you know, it looked like you had a PLC that you had just total usage of it all the time, and in the field it seems like that PLC often will have a job that it's supposed to be doing. Did you have any success um, broadcasting information out of it while it had continued its day job, basically, of whatever will make it get noticed as misbehaving? So, uh, great question. We, uh, we did some testing, and um, first of all, we're injecting these organizational blocks which are not changing the regular work of the PLC. That's just an addition of code. And the other thing is because we're copying like massive amounts of uh, buffers, the mem copy that we're using to generate the frequency, um, and we're doing it like, um, we're just copying massive chunks of data. Um, other stuff like other memory accesses are, um, are not that uh, relevant because they're not changing so much the frequency as we change. So yes, we have some noise, but um, our frequency change is much more clear than the other noise of the other ladder logic that runs on the PLC. Uh, so generally did, um, like, do you think you would have been able to observe, like, oh, this thing's running slower than it normally does. Oh, wait, no, it's better. Or was it just completely transparent? Um, we didn't test the speed. I assume, um, I'm not sure it, it would uh, slow it too much. Or, I mean, it would probably slow it somehow but without the right monitoring, without the right equipment, you won't be able to detect it. It's not like the device like, will stop producing something. It still continue producing, but maybe you know, his re reactions with the network or um, reactions with the sensors will be a few milliseconds short. And unless you have like, some statistics about it, I think it would be, be pretty hard to detect. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Great presentation. Thank you. My understanding, and I'm not a uh, ICS expert by any means, uh, is that a lot of these PLCs have a physical lock system. Um, it, it, does this require 
the lock to be in the unlocked position? So it very depends on the system. There are a wide variety of different ICS systems. This one doesn't have a lock. Um, it has a password, but think about it. Once you got into the network and you're sitting on some engineering laptop or someone who has access to the PLC and he, for example, used the password to upload that logic, you'll just see it, you know, you just see it from another malware that you have there. So a password is not going to protect the PLC. Um, a lock will, will do the job. This specific one didn't have a lock, but I think that's, that's a great example because um, like a few months ago, there was, um, there was a malware called Triton and they knew that the physical lock is going to prevent them um, getting persistency over time because they wouldn't be able to upload new level logic to there. So they um, crafted a specific um, backdoor. It's ladder logic backdoor. It's like we're doing assembly. And they uh, hooked it inside the memory. So even if someone turns the lock to non-programming mode, they'll still have an access. So yeah, that's, that's something that um, probably for attackers is, is a setback. But again, some, someday someone will turn the lock and then it will be your moment to send and attack the device. Right, and that's sort of my next question. Is there a way to remotely, if, if, if you've accessed from an, an attack vector remotely, can you detect whether it's in locked or unlocked position or is that you have to be physically present? If you're an attacker and you're trying, I think, you know, if you try to upload the ladder logic and you'll get like an error code, so it's probably locked, so it will be pretty easy. Great. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you.